So um, I'm Stephen John. I am a lecturer in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science, and I'm also Director of Studies in Philosophy here in Pembroke. Um, and my own research focuses mainly on the relationship between political philosophy, philosophy of science, and public health policy and epidemiological uh, research. So look, it's obviously a very big question, uh, how philosophy and science intersect. Um, what's easiest for me is to talk about my own, my own current research. Um, so this is research which I'm doing um, jointly with colleagues at Addenbrooke, at the Cambridge uh, Centre for Cancer Research. And they're very interested in this phenomenon of overdiagnosis. So the simplest way to understand this is, let's say you're testing lots of people to see if they've got early cancer. Um, Often that's very useful. You'll identify people who will get cancer, you intervene earlier, you save lives. The problem is you sometimes get false positives. You sometimes say she will get cancer when she won't. So then you treat that person unnecessarily. And that's kind of harmful. That looks problematic. But what's interesting is it goes to some really fundamental philosophical questions. Here's one question. Typically, when we harm people, people are aware that they have been harmed. If I punch someone, then they know they've been punched. In the case of overdiagnosis, it looks like you're harming people, but no one will ever know. Yeah? We can say things like, well, 20% of mastectomies were unnecessary, but we can never say of an individual woman, she was harmed. So then you have a question, what kind of harm is this? If it's a harm, not only does a person not know about it, they never could know about it. But you're allowed to do harm if people consent to harm being done. So if I say, do you want to have a boxing match and you agree and I punch you, I've harmed you, but it's fine, there was consent. So you say, well, people consent to the test, they consent to be treated, the harm is fine. But of course, for consent to be valid, it has to be informed, you have to know what you're getting yourself into. What you have to be informed about in these cases, well, your risk of cancer. Now, what's really interesting here is most philosophers of probability, philosophers of statistics say, there is no such thing as your risk, your individual probability. There are literally hundreds of thousands of ways you could calculate an individual's risk. And most different estimates might make a significant impact on the decision they make. I don't actually have an answer to this problem. Uh, so this is what I'm working on at the moment. And um, I will have an answer, I hope. But it's a nice example of how you go from what looks like a very specific policy-oriented question. You move down to a question in, as it were, moral or political philosophy about consent. But then you move again to a question in philosophy of science about the nature of probability the nature of risk. And so what you've done is, very quickly, you've gone to a really foundational question. Um, and that's exactly why I find it so interesting to look at these relationships between philosophy and these kind of more everyday quotidian contexts. How you do philosophy or how you do philosophical reasoning is itself something philosophers disagree about. Philosophers like to disagree. Um, but typically, I think the best way to do it is, as it were, to think about all of our commitments. Doing philosophy, the best way I think about it is to think about our different commitments, our moral commitments, or our scientific commitments, or our general commitments. And then to think, well, how can we make them most coherent? How can we figure out a way of slotting together all these things we believe, or think people ought to do, or hope for, how can we slot them together into a coherent world picture? And, but of course, you also have to be careful doing it because those kind of commitments or those things which seem obvious to you, well, you know, there are good reasons to worry. Lots of those might be culturally formed. They might reflect your own particular viewpoint or background. So there's also a kind of self-reflection on what seems obvious, on those commitments. Getting to a concrete answer in philosophy is difficult. People disagree. Um, but I think there are two things to note here. One is, one thing philosophy can do very well is tell you certain answers just aren't acceptable. 
So one thing we might not do very well is identifying the one true correct answer. But we might be able to say, look, this, clear, this answer clearly doesn't work. This answer is just internally inconsistent. Or this answer involves giving up far too much of all of our other moral or scientific or political commitments. So, well, yeah, so first we don't always get to an answer, but we often rule out answers. And then within the kind of set of reasonable answers, maybe that's where philosophy has to end, and where you say, look, it could be A, it could be B, that's for someone else to choose. People sometimes get a bit concerned by that. They say, well, you know, if you haven't got one true answer, what kind of work are you doing? But I think it's important to see that in all disciplines, people are going to have reasonable disagreements. 